Okay, ein großer Applaus für Alok und er möchte uns heute was über Social Engineering erzählen und warum einfaches Lügen uns nirgendwo hinbringt. Uh, before I'm starting, I gotta tell you that um, I'm quite nervous. Never did talks before. Uh, and the second thing that I want to announce is that I'm not gonna do Q&A here, not unlike uh, Lee. Uh, because there's another talk coming up on Berlin sites from FX, what I missed as I was here. So I'm going to really rush out going back to Berlin sites to see FX. That means no Q&A today. Um, but you can meet me later on after FX's talk. Um, today we're talking about social engineering and uh, I'm doing this talk because I saw several talks um, where people get off how good social engineer they are. Um, and the point is, social engineering is the uh, same engineering as everything else. Um, who am I? I'm an old hacker, been here in CCC since a while, um, looking like this. And as I said, we have several people really getting off themselves doing some social engineering, thinking, uh, yeah, when I lie to a guard, I'm a social engineer, I'm getting in there, and I can talk in all kinds of fancy conferences, and I get all audience, and I'm a really good guy, and telling you all kinds of stories of little cameras, and going in, and ah, I saw a laptop, I stole this laptop, so I'm a social engineer because I got in and out. But actually, that is not what it's about. Um, there's a slide I stole from Chris. Actually, um, I photoed it and put it in my slides. And there we have some uh, dictionary things which says, what is social and what is engineering? So social, this is actually something that we have here a lot, socializing with people, being together. Um, engineering, for me, this is a process what you strictly can describe as an art, as a science, and it is repeatable. If you do engineering and you can't repeat it, this is not engineering. There's a nice example if you want to find out if somebody thinks like an engineer or if somebody thinks more like every average. If I tell you, uh, can you do me a favor and describe what you do while picking up a pen? A regular person would say, well, I'll see the pen. I pick the pen up and I have a pen. An uh, engineer would say, well, my optical sensor sees a pen. Uh, the input is processed and I got an order to my um, wrapping tool. So I go down, the physical sensor proves the pen is really there. So I give the order to close that and go back. So this is the engineering side. Okay, I didn't go in deep. So I always have to run back to this thing. Um, to do social engineering engagements, you need a skill set. And the skill sets I would divide in a physical, a logical, and we need to have a customer preparation because otherwise we might end up giving the customer not what he needs. It is very important that you first look at your customer need before you're looking to get your money. Um, a physical things, uh, I explain this stuff later in the slides, but we have physical things like lock picking, stuff like this. We have the logical things like the NLP stuff. Um, the customer must understand we have several things uh, when we do attacks. We have a theoretical models of attack. We need to find out what is this business because that's really an important thing. A lot of people don't know really what their business is. Um, we have people with a bright idea. A bright person has a bright idea and he opens a business. And since the idea is bright, the business grows and it becomes bigger. So since it became bigger, he needs a people to assist him. So he gets himself a secretary and a salesman. The secretary and the salesman have bright ideas, and these ideas influence the business. So the business grows ahead because it's a good idea. It's a bright idea, as I said. And it grows and grows and grows, and so he becomes a limited. So with the limited, while growing, he needed an executive board. So he has a CIO, a CFO, a COO, whatsoever. They have bright ideas. These bright ideas go back into this business. 
they might grow ahead. They grow and grow and grow and go to a limited or probably to something with shareholders. Now, shareholders don't have bright ideas, but they won't have money. So that goes into the business. While asking this guy who first started this business, what's your business about? He will tell you your bright idea because he tells the story since 50 years. But the problem is the shareholder don't see it this way and maybe the business already grew out of this stage and maybe the business grew already in another business. Look at Apple for an example. Apple started out as a little computer company with the bright idea to build a cheap computer uh, which everybody can have. Right now, an Apple product in 90% is not a cheap computer that everybody can have, but a smartphone. So this business model, business model changed a bit. We find software right now. So the business model changed a bit. Uh, it's not the original model. So what you need to take, you need to help your customer find what is his business, what are really the assets, but we're going on that later. And last but not least, the contract. Before you go in an engagement, do a good contract. The Americans say good fences make good neighbors. In Germany, we say good friends make good contracts. Let's go into the physical and psychological skill chats. You want to do an SE attack. You should have a good understanding of craftsmanship. If you think you can just go over there and so you lie a bit and say, oh, yeah, see, I'm your new electrician and blah, blah, blah. And then you, they say, OK, you are a new electrician. That's really good because we have a power failure today. <laughs> All right. Uh, you should know what you're talking about. Or you go in as the new electrician and they put you in the electrician team and they say, oh, can you give me this and that tool? And they don't call the tool the same way like you see in the workbook but maybe they call it like they every day call that, and they say, oh, can you hand me this over? And you stand there, uh, what? <laughs> right? Um, the good thing is if you do social engineering engagements and you have to go into companies, uh, you have to find out what companies most of the time need. It's the, I, in my experience, the most needed person in a company is the guy who fixed the copy machine. So if you want to fix copy machines, you actually should have worked in a shop for half a year or something to get the experience how to fix a copy machine, otherwise you look quite fake. Um, I had a few examples here of what you could do, um, but those are the examples. It depends on your business model, what are your type of clients are. Lock picking is a good thing. Um, if you have an engagement, a physical engagement, let's say you go really in for recon or you go really in to, to steal the asset, uh, you should know a bit of lock picking. You don't need to, uh, lock, uh, to be a lock picking hero like the guys outside, but it should be good enough to open a little lock from a locker room so you maybe can wear the same clothes like the other people in the company. Stuff like this. That's good, especially when you have a company what uses on shifts and you can find out in your recon which shift is on. Um, in hostile environments, I suppose it's not a bad thing, uh, it's a bit of physical security, um, but we're not talking about hostile environments even being here behind enemy lines. Um, a good rhetoric uh, helps when you want to hack a brain. You should uh, understand the person you approach. Um, Sure enough, uh, you should have a good understanding of the psychology of people. NLP right now is something what you can't miss if you really want to go into engagements and large scale. And if you're like Dale Pearson, you can hypnose the people and go in like this. So let's go to this NLP thing that everybody's talking about. Oh, NLP, new hype word, uh, I can heal you in 20 seconds with NLP stuff. Uh, actually, that was uh, founded in the 70s from these three great persons. Um, what is uh, David Gordon, um, Bandler and, and uh, Grindr. And they used the methods of some therapists where, who worked with people who have certain disabilities and they found out that we have certain patterns to help people with different disabilities, and this pattern match. 
So um, they, they sat together. First, they, they met in like uh, little uh, rooms, apartments, and they sat together and they came up with the name Neuro Linguistic Programming, where the N is for your CPU and your brain, what sure enough, uh, do some processing over there. Um, the L goes for your I.O., for both, input and output, and the programming. Oh, well, if you don't know programming, who does? And actually, in NLP, what you do is you model a person. Uh, take this model and use the model to help another person. So what is modeling? Um, David said once, modeling is the process of uh, creating useful maps of experience. People like abilities more, but experience uh, including abilities. Um, in this process, you want to find out how your brain operates, blah, 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 what it says. Actually, we can put this down a bit more on an example. And we use this example from this book, The Drawing of the Right Side of the Brain, from Betty Edwards. And there's a story uh, what um, Mr. Gordon used to tell all the time. is about uh, therapists. Let's first go why Betty wrote this book here. Actually, this book got written because she was an um, art teacher in a university in wherever states, and she found out that some of her students are really uh, learn to draw really, really good, and some of their students just didn't write, can come up with drawing. So she wondered, what is the difference? Well, it's really bothered her that some people just can't learn drawing while she's teaching in the same way like she teach everybody else. So she actually worked out a questioning for her students, what we would now call a modeling, and she got the same questions to both types of people, the one who can draw really good and the one who can't draw really good. And then she wrote the book out of this, what she modeled there. And uh, we had this little example of um, a person who, who works with children who has a learning disability. And Emeritus, just sit down there. There's a chair for you. And this kid with the learning disabilities, uh, they come in and this, uh, this, um, this psychiatrist who helps these kids asks these kids to draw something. And those kids are totally sure they cannot learn, right? So these kids draw the stove whatsoever and it looks like when a kid draws, right? And as much as you love the kids, but when you see the first painting, it looks like shit. You go like, ah, you're looking so, so, such nice. Yeah, I see, it's myself. Uh, what, of the three strokes? Uh, that's me, that's sure me. But actually, you're lying to your kid, and that looks like shit. So children draw like children draw, but she talks to these kids for about 10, 15 minutes and tell them to look right at what you want to draw and tell them how to do it. And what comes out are pictures like this, what I took from a website, what Meredith yesterday actually told me that's a good site for, to explain what I'm talking about. There's this little child, um, I, I think it just took out the uh, references. Um, uh, what you need to know is I created this on this open office, library office bullshit thing because I'm usually run on Linux but somehow the virtual box uh, cannot uh, do the full screen on both screens. But I didn't want the Guto man here. I want to do your talk first, or should I just put my jammer on? <laughs> um, I didn't want a Gutenberg, so the original slides have the where you find these drawings. Uh, that's a really bad thing that it's now out here. Uh, there's a little kid, I think her name was Tara, and she was eight, and in the class she got um, they told her she should write the cover or draw the cover of her most favorite book. So that was her first attempt up there. Here it is, does it see? That's the first attempt. Then her teacher was talking to her for a while. So that was the second attempt. And if you see the third attempt, that's amazing. That's the third attempt of the same child after about 20 minutes talking. So NLP really can do something. Now it's the question, what are you talking about NLP? Is this an NLP workshop? No, it's social engineering, still. Now you say, why modeling? I mean, modeling, practically you can problems and add abilities. Adding abilities for a social engineer is something what you really want to do. 
Then we have sure evolutionary things and the spiritual side, what we not go deep into that. Uh, there's an experimental array, what usually gonna be used, you not really need to read through all this because it's really not an NLP workshop. Um, this NLP array was drawn again, the letters are missing, by Mr. David Gordon, and he got a copyright on that thing. Oh man, I really have to work hard to not be in Gutenberg here. And it actually shows what the enabling causes is, the motivation causes, and you have to actually ask the right questions to find out all these causes, what you see here, uh, which belief template people have, uh, which strategies to use, which emotions to use, so that we can actually, in the end of the day, have the same ability like the person. So that has something to do with asking the right question to a person who's doing something really good. If you want to copy something, what is really good, you have to ask the right questions. From that going to what we're using our central processing units here, our little neck top on our heads, our heads, a little neck top, and um, to see what's going on and uh, seeing we have keywords, we have states, and we have actually attributes, we have first to understand how this little neck top works. And our neck top works this way that we actually can process Okay, there's 100 trillion teraflops on my side after the pH party, or actually the, the pheno party. There's no processing on my brain no more. But usually you should have like 100, 100 um, what is this, 100 billion? No, trillion teraflops. Your sensors receive this uh, 10,000 bit per second, but the problem is you only process 40 of them. So that makes uh, making up your, your world. So the way I see you, like the guy sleeping over there, uh, is not the same way he sees himself right now in dreamland. Um, and that makes up, if you look in the mirror, you don't see the same person what I see when I look at you. Our brain is playing with us, big time. Uh, if you want, I can put the slides online. Um, so we need to use this in engagement, so we're going now more direction engagement. Uh, when we talk to people, we really need to listen for keywords while talking to these persons. And we have several keywords, uh, as you see here, we have stress, freedom, love, and, and so on and so on. And we need to find, again, it was made in, it's now PowerPoint, it was made in LibreOffice, so they got little problems with the adjustment of the letters. Uh, we have to find out what's your internal state what means, what do you think in which state you are? Like, I'm standing here thinking I'm awake, but I sure I, have, I can't be awake after these three days. And this is versus uh, against what your totally right uh, state is, what I will see when I look this on video later on. Uh, probably going to be totally disappointed about myself that I'm not the hero I, I think I am. Um, and you have to pay attention to the micro expressions people do. Every time when you talk to somebody, people do micro expressions about, except the few guys who are sleeping here, they do a macro expression. <laughs> you have to understand this difference between the states. And you see this difference in the words when they use the words, like here we have the difference between he feels like he is really doing this and that, or he has done it. That's a difference between an attribute and a state. The, the thing is, if you want to learn all this stuff and, and, and use this for an engagement, you should first um, use yourself an as an example. So you should try to generate a state. So you, you try to get yourself into a state by self-suggestions. Sub um, before you go and play with others. Uh, you can actually use the words what people actually telling you to convert them into a state when you use the wise words in the right term. But this is not a pickup guide here, um, but a social engineering talk. So you should not forget um, you have several millions of, of um, these messages you get in by your sensors, um, 
you cannot really process more than seven, more or less, one, two, one at a time. So you have an overwhelming income on information, and you store a lot of this income on information, of this information you just gathered. The problem is you cannot process them. Your necktop is quite good, but the memory readout, we, we should really work on our stack. That's not really good working. So the question is, what is this cold reading I'm talking about with the micro-expression and all this stuff? Well, when you, when you come first enter a room, there's the saying, you, there is no second chance for the first impression. And that's what it is. You approach the guard, and your first impression is, well, this person sitting here is dressed in a guard's uniform, his nails are clean, his teeth are brushed, he don't smell like cigarettes, he is very proper and straight. You, you approach him and you say, sir, how can I help you, sir? And you know this man is well-trained, know his business, uh, you maybe not fuck around with him, and he's not sloppy and takes care about himself. So we have several things where you should uh, take a look when you approach a person. The uniform type he wears is as casual, is this a military uniform? Is this a doctor's uniform? Um, which, which clothes does he have on? Which type of body he has? Is he more like a geek? Or is this a sportsman? Is this a fat man? Is this a woman? Big, tall, whatsoever. <laughs> Gender, age. I wouldn't approach a young woman the same way like an old man. Definitely not. Um, so, ethical. And this is not about racism, it's about, uh, about histories. So people would react different to different words if they have different ethnics. So you should put this in into your engagement. The manners and discipline, as I said, is a well-trained person? Is he pretending to be a high-class person? Is he a high-class person? Do you expect him to do what he says doing? Or do you know, it's like, like I'm working in a company and we work a lot with people from Bosnia, actually in Bosnia, and I got the experience when you tell the person in Bosnia, please, would you do me a favor, do that? The person says, sure, no problem, as long as you look at him. <laughs> and when you turn around and be in your plane back at home, uh, you find out it hasn't been done. Um, so, yes, you have to take a look at this, a manner and discipline. Markings. Markings could be tattoos, piercing, scars, all kinds of markings. Uh, the smell, don't underestimate what you can find out by smell. Somebody smells heavy for cigarettes and has yellow teeth, so I know he needs to get out for the next cigarette soon. And probably not there when I need it. Hence, be assured you can't tell a fighter by his hands. Always look at hands. If you're going in an engagement physical, you should not uh, underestimate what can happen. Sometimes when an act of compromise, you maybe get even in a fight uh, with the guard until you can pull out your little letter, hey, I'm here because you asked me to. So hence, uh, something what you could look at and the interaction with you. Does he take notice when you walk in? May not. Um, there's a guy, Dr. Friesen, and I have to read this because I usually, yeah, a thousand. Uh, there are a thousand unical uh, expressions, but I think more or less you're using of these thousand probably really proper a lot, reading out uh, 128. Um, you have 30, uh, 43 muscles in your, in your face, and there is a strange connection between your neural cortex and your muscles in your face, so instantly, when I put your hand on, on a hot stove, you will react in your face, not even thinking about it. So that's where they made up these things and looked it up and had big studies about it and found out there is something what we call micro-expressions. Micro-expressions, you know, from when somebody lifts his eyebrow, when you say something, stuff like this, and there's even a TV series called The Liar Me. Uh, I'm not really sure because I don't own a TV. I'm a poor guy. Uh, and there are some charts uh, actually showing what I'm talking about. These expressions are very important when you approach somebody to social engineer him. Yes, I know social engineering is not just this, but we got deeper in that later on. So here you see different um, 
different um, expressions like disgust, fear, sadness, surprise, and so on. And you see, the most where you see things is actually in the eyes and the eyebrows and the mouth. That's where you get the most expressions out. Okay, before I approach my client, I first uh, do this investment and know who I am approaching. So this is an investment from what cost me probably one week. I know uh, most guys who are really in pen testing, a week is expensive, um, but this week is very well spent money. Um, there's one, my most favorite friend, his name is Google, and he got a brother as LinkedIn. Those two guys are so cool. You just ask anything and you know the co-workers, the former co-workers, the next co-workers to come, and who is the admin, the who whatsoever. So those two guys, Google and LinkedIn, can tell you a lot. Facebook too. And Facebook is even better because Facebook, you don't need even a browser. You do this per script. Um, these information is what you find out. You should use actually in your first uh, approach to the customer because you have now you know the customer better than the customer knows you. For an instance, you get into the customer and he say, yeah, I'm, I'm scared about APT. And you say, oh, well, APT, nothing to be scared about. This is uh, just a word for Chinese attacks. It doesn't matter how cheap the SSL script is. Um, well, um, this guy is calling you in because he got a fear. He would not spend this heaps of money on a pen test when he wouldn't fear that something get lost. Right? If the person fears that his business probably gets problems and he gets himself a pen testing team, uh, you could probably use this by the first approach when you talk to him, hey, Mr. So-and-so, how is your daughter doing? Is she back good? Um, is her health back again? So he sees that you know your business. You come in and you talk to somebody and the person already see that you did interact with him before you saw him. Another important thing is the physical recon. Oh, it did the little hook in there again. Every time I look through the slides, this little hook is gone by physical recon. And every time I have the slides on, it's back on. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. Um, the physical recon is that you see or you go in, you jump in uh, into your uh, engagement's place, wherever the customer has it, if it's a... Uh, um, facility where they build stuff, or if it's um, whatsoever, a shop, a uh, high tower, and you look at this as a facility, you look for things like cameras, you look for things like alarm systems, you check out backup types of alarm systems, you check out which type of guards do they have. Do they have guards like get overpaid like most of the guards with six euro an hour? Uh, we have a little thing like if the in Germany, we got some CIA type of thing, and they have guards, uh, they call themselves BND, um, what's an intelligence service, and they have well overpaid guards, they get almost, I think, six euros an hour, and I think you really can buy yourself in. I mean, some of these guys have to get welfare uh, because the state, the country, the government try to be cheap. The problem is the welfare is paid for by the government too, uh, but well. Uh, and they had to get stolen uh, some of their little drawings, how their buildings looks like, but nothing important. Um, you should check for video surveillance, definitely, if this is a video surveillance that follows you, or it's just a regular video surveillance, if it's infrared, how does it work, is it, do you have trip plates, whatsoever. And you should check for security systems at all. Dogs are security systems too, and they can really hurt. Oh, then you meet the client, and now you really need your NLP, because the whole story, what I told you about the first time when he opened his business, until your entry point is, you need to evaluate the story. And then you need the relations to his uh, customers and the relations to his vendors. Why is this so important? Because we have a business like the car business. Is anybody here working in the car business? 
You're all smart people. Um, the car business is like this. We have an OEM vendor. This is the car maker. Call him Dollar Random Car Maker. And we have uh, our vendor. This is, let's say, producer, glass producer, fabric producer, X, Y, Z. Um, if you're in the car business as a vendor, you call the car business and say, oh, you know what, uh, I want to sell you whatsoever you want to sell them. And you say, okay, when you want to sell me what you ever want to sell me, uh, you're going to buy your stuff there on this vendor, this is what you, where you're going to buy because we trust this vendor for this price. You see this? You have to buy by a vendor, that's Magna. You have to go to Magna and buy by Magna for the price what your customer tells you. A few days later, your customer says, ah, it's too expensive for myself, and goes to Magna, negotiates a new price, and you get from your customer the new price and have to pay the old price. So car business is not really what you want to be in there. But these are relationships you need to find out, but because these relationships make decisions, people in the car business will be very, very, very oriented on saving money because of that. And this is what you need to find and this is what you need to see in, in your recon. You need to find out which assets you got. Finding out assets you can do first and most by talking to the middle management because those are the people running the company. The middle management is running the company, so you need to associate with them and you, should need, you really need to talk to, with them, you really need to engineer them, because those are the people who know what's going in and out, and those are people who really know what the asset is. For an instant, there's this talk from Nickerson, again him, um, five ways to destruct a company. Anyone knows this term? Five ways to destroy a company, Brucon, last year? You know it? Actually, Nickerson got booed out on it, uh, because people thought it was too offending, but he made a clear point. He was talking about a company that was a hospital. Well, we're all people and we have feelings and say, oh, hospital, you can't attack a hospital. What if I ask a hospital, what is your asset? The answer would be, yeah, it's customer data is an asset, a very important asset. Credit card information is the most important asset. No. The most important asset you have in a hospital is the life of your customer. So if an attacker would just mix up the machine, what mixes the medicine, I tell you one thing, after a few deaths, your business ain't running anymore. No. So this is an asset what you should protect more than other assets. And that's what you find out in a threat modeling. Uh, threat modeling, we had a really nice talk in Berlin, starts from the famous Der Stift. Uh, who was really into that. And, and the threat models, you actually find out where are the vulnerabilities? Does the vulnerability hurt? Um, is the stuff what you can hurt uh, users? Does the stuff hurt the business? And that's what for us as an attacker is the most important fi point, finding out when does it hurt the business because we have to protect our customer. right? So we need to do a threat modeling before we go into our engagement. Sure, there are several models of the threat modeling. I'm not really go deep into that because that's not a threat modeling talk, but you should have seen that we really should use this as an engineering background for our social engineering attack, what we later launch. And those are stride model. I know now people say, oh yeah, but what do you think about the other models and the Microsoft and CIA? Yes, sure. Uh, we have the dread model. And to upset some people, we even have an attack tree. I know attack trees are not really used no more, but I hear from a company who has a really well thought out attack tree and they're instantly being noticed when some systems are compromised, how much does it cost to fix, how much does it cost it not to fix, and all these kinds of stuff. So an attack tree is not the worst thing you can have. Now we go to the assessment. What do you need? Why does the social engineer go to the assessment? What's that about? Well, you need to be with the assessment because you did the recon, because you talked to the people, because you are the one who has the plan where to walk, because you know where the assets are. So the first thing before the assessment is you have to work out a storyboard. A storyboard includes the backup plan, sure enough. 
Uh, I know I wrote it extra, but uh, this is for certain people. I know that they really appreciate that I put this in. You put together a team. Now thinking about an assessment, we found out we have a client and his asset, he is probably a software vendor, his asset is a new, brand new software, and I have a person like FX in my team, and he's a brilliant brain and he could probably has an exploit prepared, but I'm just a dumb social engineer and I cannot deploy this exploit, so I need to take him and my team. But if I have a person like FX in my, who knows FX? Oh, that's not a lot for this big room. Um, if I have a person like FX and the team, one need to know he's not the best sportsman in the world. <laughs> well, I would uh, think that if your plan, uh, your landing zone, uh, somehow involves climbing and running, FX probably should have somebody who carries him. So you should have in your team probably two strong men. Um, the next thing what you need is your landing zone, the insert point. And the insert point is not the infiltration point. The insert, insert point uh, could be the main hall of a high tower. The insert point could be the backyard of whatever you're attacking. Let's say it's the main hall from a high tower. That's the insert point. So your team gathers there, right? Uh, with a Proxima tree, you already have the badges prepared, and you go now one by one by one in and meet at the rally point and wait there if somebody has made an active compromise. So you stay in the rally point, check the plans, check back if everything works fine, check the equipment before you start your assessment. Okay, nobody found you, you are not compromised, you can go ahead with your business. You go out and the hideout maybe is not used in every assessment, but we should mention it. Let's say we have a company with shifts, or let's say, what's even better, we have a company with no shifts. So let's see, we already know by social engineering that the administration group leaves a uh, building at 7 p.m. And through our recon, we know uh, the fastest response from an administrator could be within 25 minutes. We know more through the social media that the lead admin who really got the knowledge goes to his most favorite pub directly after he was training after work. So he goes from work to training, what's more unlikely when it's a real admin. Um, but from, them, he, from there he goes to his most favorite pub and he has a few beers, uh, a few more, sometimes even vodka mate. <laughs> so, you just find a place where you can hide out and wait till the people are gone. Now you can estimate the time, if you get compromised, what you have for extraction. The next thing is you have to do the infiltration because the insertion is not the infiltration. Infiltration is directly when you bring your engineer to the server room. When you use the, the stolen fingerprint or when you use uh, your copied uh, entry card, your stolen punch in code whatsoever to get in the server room, uh, when you used your little Mac light to make sure that the camera didn't see you while you go in. And trust me, all these IP cameras have times where they just blank out. Once in a while, they just be blank. So the guard really wouldn't notice if this is just a short time when you blank it out. Uh, if you have tripwires, that's a different story. And that's the time what you actually do your direct infiltration into the server room. Then you have to find and fetch the data, use your exploit, however you're gonna do that. And then you have to exfiltrate data. All these points uh, will be named later in the slides. After, if you exfiltrate, uh, exfiltrate the data, there are several ways to exfiltrate them, you are good. And there's a difference in between exfiltration and extraction. As long as you exfiltrate, that's very good because you're an asset. As soon as you ex be extracted, you're a liability. Uh, so there's a difference between it. And this difference makes if you have an active passive compromise or not. If you're being compromised, you have to do it again or your customer wins. 
Um, sure enough, you have to have a backup plan, as I said before. And then there's something what bloggers know, writing, um, but they don't know it this way because this is useful writing. <laughs> um, yes, this is a writing a report. Every one of us should really understand one thing. Your long hair, big glasses, thinny guy writing, I got root on your shell, I found the exploit, 11087. And the top manager say, yeah? So? That's not the way to talk to management. If you want to talk to management, you say, I found this and this compromise in your machine, which cost you yearly this amount on dollars, brings you this business in danger. I found this exploit, this cost you that amount of money, don't really bring your uh, business in danger. You tell them how much it costs if they leave it, you tell them how much it costs if it's fixed, and you tell them what it costs if you don't fix it. That is how to talk to management. There's one thing what we should know, we all should be capable to talk to bloggers because they don't understand shit. If we are nosy enough as an industry to say, oh, they should learn what Nessus just printed out, uh, fuck you. We need to talk the language of our customer because he pays us. That's the point. <laughs> and that's why it's so important to write a, a good, proper report because if he gets out of business because our report was fucked up, he can't fucking pay us, right? Then we do another business impact analysis with the customer together to say, see, you thought that's your business. My recon actually found out your business is something totally different. Uh, and if that and that happens and APT comes over the way, well, this is the impact. You need to do more than one customer meeting, not your money and go. You should have a good relationship with your customer. I once had a talk in Brucon where I talked about uh, um, incident response, and I say, if you have a forensic in your company, it's good, but you should have another forensic company, and you pay him for nothing every fucking day until something happens. But if something happens, you have a team you worked with for years, they know you, your assets, they know what they can talk about to police and they know what to hide because it's your business uh, data is what nobody should know. If you just get um, a forensic or a, um, a team, a red team, the day when you need them, it's too late. You have to have a relationship. And this relationship, most of the time, not comes from the CIO, CSO, because they don't have the funding. So they have to come from you. You have to convince. So you have to do more customer meetings than one. And most important, train the customer. What, what did he say? If you give a man a fire, he's warm. If you set him on fire, he's warm for the rest of his life. <laughs> you have to train these people. I have always in my agreements, when I did Red Team, I said, if I find anything, mistakes by your employees, if it's not on purpose made, you're not allowed to fire them, but to train them. Because if you fire them, you get a new one doing the same mistake. If you have a guard, you trained him well, and you told him, yeah, that's a big mistake, cost me heaps of dollars, but, well, I train you, and now you know better, he will appreciate that you didn't fire him. And there's one thing what you really need in your company, what you can't buy with money, is loyalty. So training is an important thing. Let's go a bit to infiltration. Um, which type of infiltrations we have? We have the physical infiltration, what is the, the tailgating, what today and our days shouldn't work really good, and we have the logical by piggybacking. We have uh, stealing fingerprints using our FID skimmers, and those skimmers are really good. I like them. Um, you can copy entry badges with the Proxmark for an sample. Um, you have cast key skimmers, that is important for recon. You can drop a key, at least put a sticker on it that says 32 gig and above, <laughs> because no one's going to care for 8 gig stick. Oh, it's cheap. Um, you can pick locks to get in. Even nowadays, the new electronic locks, uh, you're picking more of a skimmer, I know. Um, 
you can enter as a vendor and as a client. Here are some examples that I don't make that up by myself. Yes, these tools exist. Uh, here we have this USB key. Oops, does it go back? Yes. We have this USB key. And please do not tell me that one person, not even one person in your company, wouldn't pick up this cute guy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little story. There's this, this group uh, they call French police. And they got conflicted because somebody was too lazy to use the network. He plugged a key out, put it in a computer from work, and boom, they had it. It's sad that Stuxnet was laying around on a USB key for a while, uh, but I can't prove that. Well, this is the Proxmark tree disassembled. So you see on this little coin here how small it is, and that is assembled with a self-built antenna. It's my lockpick set. And up here, we have the car skimmers, and on the CDs, we have already the calculation codes from all brands, uh, vendors from cars. So don't you know, change the key every time I hit the button. Yeah, but uh, the patterns are known, so fuck that shit. Uh, what, what do I would steal a car? No, I don't steal. I'm a social engineer. I'm not capable of stealing, but I can put a GPS sensor on it, and I see how far the admins has to drive to work. Oh, stow every morning? Very good. Yes, don't working. Uh, finding fetching data, except the uh, bloggers of us, everybody knows that stuff. Uh, we're going to the printer. Um, in the printer are hard drives, and the hard drives are all data are stored. But please do not get the printer from the marketing unit. That's stupid. <laughs> you can spare fish, uh, and spare fishing is an attack, a social engineering attack, but you cannot avoid. If somebody in your company says, I'm sending you tomorrow a presentation for the boss and you should look after it, and then the next day you're sending me the presentation, you will open it. No doubt about it. It's an internal mail. Um, yeah, we have this uh, buffer overflow, so it's hacker stuff. Uh, it's not for really, nobody hacks here. <laughs> uh, we have keylogger. We can steal keys with Lobcrack. Uh, what did they get back from Symantec? So it's not evil no more. Uh, and then we can exfiltrate, or have to exfiltrate the data. We can use a USB stick. Um, we can put a printout in the trash, but now you need to know, if you print out something and it says business name, business unit, number, some good worker would pick it up and say, oh shit, and put it in the shred. What you do is, you see the text, print it out in base 64, and then put it in the trash. Everybody now thinks, oh, that's just misprinted and forget about it. Um, sure enough, you can take pictures. That's the oldest way to exfiltrate. Uh, use a GSM, what you just put somewhere and go to data over that. Or noise. Uh, there's this, you know this bald head, ugly Israeli guy, Ian? <laughs> well, he got a really nice way to exfiltrate. They, they use this on, put this on noise, and then they put this on their answering machine and decode it. You have to see his talk, it's really good. Um, and there's another thing with noise, there's this talk from, what was his name again? Uh, Sergey, do you know the name from the guy who did the, actually recorded the noise from a, from a CPU uh, while decoding a text? It doesn't matter, slides are up uh, later and you have to go to this website, there's a really nice article about that. Let's go to active compromise. What is an active compromise? An active compromise is when the dog bites you in the butt, I would say. An active compromise is when your alarm system sounds. Uh, so what can you do? You can cut the alarm since landline and use a GSM blocker to make sure the backup line don't work, except you in Germany. We don't use uh, GSM blockers here, sure enough. Um, <laughs> Video surveillance is an active compromise. Every one of you know what an active compromise is, at latest when the police is at your house and raids your computers, right? But what the hell is a passive compromise? A passive compromise is you are in the hideout, somebody walks by and goes ahead. So now, did he see you or didn't he, didn't he see you? You don't know, so it's a passive compromise. A passive compromise is you are in the fucking box, you got shell, and then boom, you're out. Does they have to just change the password? Did they find you? What is it? So it's a passive compromise. It's a no, not no. Actually, it's a not, no, no. 
Not no, no. It's a, a passive compromise. And you have a machine in the network, it's kicked out, you get the message, right? Oh, well, I'll make it before time because I want to go back to FX. Don't worry about the five minutes. <laughs> yeah, actually, that was more or less an overview of what you should be capable of doing as a social engineer because you are the one who leads the team in. You don't do the exploit, but you lead the team in, you bring the team to the exit, and you bring them back out because you're the one who can talk to guard, the guard in and out. You are the one who did the recon, the physical recon through the halls. You should be the one who is capable to tell the assets because you are the one who engineered the people. That's the reason why you go with the engineering team if you have a physical assessment. And that's why you support your team if you have a non-physical assessment and tell them, uh, okay, they use this email system and that's the person really you should talk to when you want to approach whatsoever you want to. And you are the one who is actually um, talking to your team members and train your team members. So you as a social engineer have to know all these things, otherwise you're just a retard. You're stealing on your customers. And one more thing, okay, I'm not planning on dying this year, but still, one more thing. You dare sell a social engineering engagement. This is stealing from your customer. I go in and out everywhere, that doesn't matter. Because going in and out, there are brochures for from your customer. They print this, they have a marketing, public relations and stuff like this. If you cannot find assets, your whole engagement is worthless. And the customer don't need to be worried about it. So just selling a social engineering engagement is stealing from your customer. You want to help these people to get secure, not fuck them over. And that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>